So yeah, welcome to the advanced debugging for .NET Shop, uh, .NET applications on Docker. So my name is Idan Schatz. I'm a developer advocate here at uh, Ozcode. And I'm glad that uh, Omer, our magical CTO and co-finder, uh, able to join us. Hi, so, so before we get started, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> from now on, all right. But no. So uh, before we start some housekeepings, um, we packed a lot of content for you today. So we might have a very short time to do Q&A at the end. So please uh, join our Slack channel. Uh, you can post your questions and thoughts during the webinar and we will try to answer most of them at the end of the webinar or maybe after. Uh, so yeah, feel free to join the conversation. So let's get started. So Omer, uh, I think it was a month ago, we were thinking about what webinar we should do next. And you have um, a thought that it's a good time for us to do webinar that is focused on Docker. Can you share uh, why now and why Docker? Well, I think it's just um, something that we've been seeing coming from our customers, um, you know, more and more with every day. Um, dot Net on Docker containers on Linux seems to be growing uh, exponentially. Uh, we've been hearing from customers that are um, deploying to Docker on A Azure, on AKS, on the managed Kubernetes service. And then the next day, we heard from another customer who's having trouble debugging services that are running on um, the managed uh, Kubernetes service on the Google Cloud. And then the next day, we're hearing uh, from customers um, that are using EKS, the Amazon uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, solution. And all of these uh, issues around how do I even begin debugging a Docker application, right? I know I'm a .NET developer. I know how to you know, start up a lap, uh, desktop application on my laptop and put a breakpoint and start stepping through it. But what do I do when it's some Docker container running completely isolated somewhere out there in the, in the, in the cloud? So um, we've been hearing that more and more and more. And we just decided that maybe it's time to really go deep on what is Docker? How do I deal with this new crazy world of Docker containers and microservices? That, that is a really, I think, uh, great introduction because the first thing that we wanna do here is to make sure that we are leveling the playing field. You know, some, peop some people in our audience are experts in Docker and some of them, you know, never use it and it looks scary. So that's why we decided to do a short introduction to Docker here, um, but really just try to do it in the perspective of a .NET developer. There is a lot of content about Docker, but we, we will focus on, if you're a .NET developer, what the Docker would mean to you. And we will try to explain Docker by comparing it into older virtual machines software. Uh, if you use Azure Portal and you start a virtual machine, you probably will be good, good to go and follow this webinar along. So let's start with Docker Engine. Um, if you have your development machine, the metal here, uh, and you run your host machine, uh, host OS, which probably would be Windows, and you want to set up some virtual machine on that, uh, on your laptop, the first thing that you will need to install is a software called Hypervisor, which really allow you to spin up virtual machines that are today use all kinds of software and hardware acceleration stuff to really allow the virtual machine to connect directly to the metal. But you still need this layer to actually allow everything to live uh, along, along with each other. Now, when you put a virtual machine, you actually need to do two things. First, you need to load the operating system, usually called the guest OS and also an application, which probably what you want to debug in the first place. Now, if you look at this slide, there is a lot of OS boxes here because that is really what happened. There is a lot of resources that get consumed just to load the kernel of those operating systems. But us as developers, what we really care about is just running the application. And I think that is the really the big innovation of why Docker is really become mainstream in development because they think how we can reduce that waste of running the guest operating system. 
And the idea is instead of actually load the entire kernel of that operating system, they load into memory a thin layer that will basically take all the functionality of that operating system or a subset of that, and then tunnel it through the Docker engine to the host OS. So what you actually get is a very thin layer that represents to this application an Ubuntu operating system, for example. And you can really get into really amazing things with that. For example, the Alpine OS in Docker is just a five megabyte image, which is extremely small. There is not enough functionality in that operating system, but it's really consumed the minimum amount of resources. And of course, you can also load a Windows operating system inside the container. And that is something that I really want to emphasize here is that Docker is really just a virtual machine in, for our sake. Uh, but the cool thing, you just require much less resources to boot up the guest operating system. Now, you can see here that the Windows operating system is big. And we try to do it a little bit of scale, and we will talk about it a little bit in a moment. But Windows operating system, if you want to run applications that think they're under Windows, you need to put a lot of uh, features that the Windows system come with it. And that's why, uh, as a .NET developer, you have two options when you're using Docker. One is Linux container, and the other is Windows containers. And like I mentioned, Windows containers are large. They are several gigabytes, while Linux containers could be small. Um, I just mentioned the five mega example, but uh, if you want to run ASP.NET, it will go to 200 megabytes at the moment. Um, Linux container, of course, will run .NET Core, but if you have legacy code based on Windows using .NET framework, you can use Windows containers for that. Omer, would you like to add something? Yeah, one awesome addition uh, that is coming in .NET 5 is that Microsoft is working on something they call assembly trimming, um, also known as tree shaking. Uh, what that means is that when I deploy my self-contained .NET Core uh, or ASP.NET Core application to my Docker container, um, during the compilation or linking phase, it will actually go through all of the code, all of the methods in my assemblies, find out what is not actually being used put to use and just remove all of that stuff. Now, of course, because it's .NET and we do a lot of reflection magic and, and whatnot, that can be a bit risky. So you have to do it with care, but still you're able to create extremely small Docker containers. And this all speaks back to the notion of, you know, container uh, density, which and, and when yeah. we talk about containers, we, we often use this term density obsessively. And, and essentially what we mean by that is how many isolated uh, pieces of software can I run on the same um, amount of physical hardware? How much mileage can I get out of the same amount of, of physical hardware? So if I, of course, if I'm, if I'm using Windows VMs, that's a huge chunk of memory. So if I have two different applications and each has to be in their own VM uh, running IS or whatnot, that's pretty huge. But if I'm running a, a Docker container um, that's you know, just a few tens or hundreds uh, at, at most uh, megabytes each, um, that's a huge difference. Totally. So let's dive into uh, what actually defines the size of those images. And in order to explain what Docker images are, we will, again, go back to virtual machines and see how, um, how you use them and how you take snapshots and then correlate that into what Docker layers are. So um, a VM, usually you put it from a base image or even an installation disk. And then you can start running your instance. But after a while, for example, when you finish all the Windows updates, you want to freeze it and take a snapshot before you continue to the next step. So usually what you will do, you will pause the virtual machine and create a snapshot or a checkpoint. Uh, usually it's called a standard checkpoint in Hyper-V Manager. And that will actually do two things. First, it will save the new disk image that you have and also all the memory. Um, really similar of how you hibernate your computer. Um, but those images could be big and the differences between those images could be very small, just few updates or install a new program. That's why usually when you store those uh, additional checkpoints, they actually just the Delta. What has changed from the previous one? 
And that gives you all kinds of cool things, like take another snapshot and store the delta from this one and then allow you to go back. And there is another option that you can actually shut down your VM. So you don't need to store the memory anymore. And then you can create a snapshot only for the disk. And keep that in mind when we will actually talk about what Docker layers are, but they are very, very similar to the same concept that when you run a VM, you start from a base image, and then you create your checkpoints with some modifications. And the running VM at the top have a read-write layer that where all the new changes happen. And that is exactly what Docker does. You start from a base image, and then you add all kinds of images with modifications. And on the top, you have the container layer, which usually the file system for the running container. Now, remember that Docker actually used the host OS to do all the features. So instead of actually storing big images of physical disk, Docker can only save the changed files, which really another cool feature that really helped Docker minimize those files in the first place. And because all those images actually store on the host OS, if you run two Docker containers, that entire layer is that doesn't need to be duplicated for every VM or every container. They actually use the same memory on the host OS. And only the modifications or the, the memory of that internal container, this is what has to be separated and virtualized, which again, like Omer said, increased the density. Um, how we create those layers is also a very cool thing uh, that is really a big difference from VMs that instead of VMs that you need to run and run scripts and uh, do some manual uh, effort to create those checkpoints, Docker introduced something called the Docker file. Now, as a .NET developer, and we will show it a uh, little on, you just right click, add Docker support in Visual Studio, and you will get this template Docker file. They're not so interesting, um, but I do want to show them because when we will show how we install the agent, we will need to talk with them a little bit. So let's dive into a small part of that just to reference back to how layers are get created. So this line decide the base image. Where do we start from? This line say copy some files from the host OS inside the container and create a new layer with those new files added to the file system. This is more interesting. This tell the container start from the previous layer, from the previous state run the .NET restore command. And when it's done, look at what change and create a new layer with just those changes. So you can have those scripts run automatically and create a new image every time you compile. Very, very cool feature. Um, any more word of wisdom, Omer, before we go into how we actually debugging Dockers? Well, I just think that this is like a really cool transformation, right? We're defining what's the equivalent of a VM, right? Well, hopefully so far we've convinced all of our attendees that if they know what a VM is, they more or less understand Docker. It's not that all that different from, from VMs, but we define what's actually in all of the dependencies we have programmatically inside that Docker file. So it's repeatable, it's just like code and every line in that Docker file creates a new layer or a new checkpoint essentially. So very, very easy to grok, very repeatable, uh, very easy to work with from a DevOps perspective as well. Exactly. Um, when we talk about debugging, um, let's just start from the basic. You have your ID on one side and your application on the other and you want to debug. So the, the, the way the ID actually communicate with the application that you're debugging is basically using the OS debugging API that allow you to uh, inspect, freeze, add breakpoints, read memory, all kinds of very intrusive things that you can do to the process. However, when we talk about Dockers, it's basically um, the application is no longer on the same OS. It's actually on the same computer, but not on the same OS. So there is a gap that we need to bridge. And in order to get into that, I, first I would actually introduce our guest for, the, for, for today. And that is a super night school sample project that we made for you. Uh, it's a .NET application 3.1 uh, with three microservices. Everything is written on ASP.NET and it's have Docker support. So let's have a look on that. So as you can see here, 
this is the UI service and tell us that there is two other services that are running. Um, and let's look at just the project itself. You can see several services, each services is very, very simple. And in order to actually create uh, a Docker support, you just go to add Docker support. And that will basically generate this Docker file for you. Uh, there is some few modifications that we will talk about later on that how we uh, that we did here, but basically that it. Now we actually running that entire um, uh, service using Docker Compose. Docker Compose is a really handful utility that allow you to run several Docker's at the same time uh, easily, and then attach to all the outputs that they are running. Now I want the to debug what happened here, uh, the service app, where do they get the statistics from? Now, in order to do that, because we are not running uh, the Docker is from Visual Studio, they're already running, uh, they were already running, we will do attach to process that basically allow you to connect to remote processes, uh, remote debugging, but also connect to a Docker Linux container. And the first thing that you will need to do is to find, usually it will look at your local host, the Docker engine, and we can see our three Dockers uh, that are running here. You can see the command, how long they're up and everything, and we do okay. Now, um, actually that happened pretty quick, so we will actually do it ourselves to actually explain what happened. The first thing that, we, that uh, Docker does, that Visual Studio does, is run something similar to Docker PS to show you all the running Dockers on your machine. Then it will do Docker top on the service that I chose and basically see all the running processes that I have currently on that uh, Docker. And that is exactly what we see here, that process and everything is great. We can choose, we need to choose here first that we want just to debug manage code and we can do attach. Now we say that it's launching debug adapter. Um, let's try to see what's really happening once it's actually able to connect to the process. Amazing. It was able to connect to the process and we can go to the cost controller and you see uh, models were loaded and the breakpoint is alive and running. Now, how that magic happens, how that connection actually happened. So if we will go here and run the same command, Docker top on the same service, we see there is some stuff here happening. Now let's try to explain really what's going on here. So we did attach to process and what really Visual Studio do for us behind the scene, it's actually injecting VS debug into the container and by using the STDI or feature of Docker, it will actually able to communicate directly with no additional uh, certificates and stuff like that, like remote debugging usually have. So it's actually connected directly to the VS debug and the VS debug use the native debugging API to actually debugging your application. And if we go back to Visual Studio and actually let's just refresh this page. So we will trigger that and you see we actually jump inside and we can actually see that we can inspect everything. And that is a complete normal debugging experience. Now I am using the um, Oscode ID extension so we can actually go and say, I want to see if there was a schedule for that course or not. And you can see all the details already inside uh, the container. Anything you would like to add Omer? Yeah. It I would just like to add here that essentially what uh, Visual Studio is doing here is remotely accessing and running processes on the um, Docker container remotely, right? In order to get VSDBG up and running. And that's something that you could do yourself, right? With the command of Docker exec and create a shell on that Docker container. Uh, um, and that is really interesting um, because 
Uh, what that means is that you can also launch certain tools that come with .NET. So there's a, a tool called .NET uh, Trace, which will allow you to do diagnostics remotely on that Docker container, like look at performance counters and uh, event traces, uh, metrics, things like that. There's also a tool called uh, .NET Dump, which will allow you to create a dump for um, a crash or an exception that happened inside of your Docker container. Of course, you would then have to create a volume mapping so you can actually extract that dump out of the Docker container because you'll typically probably feel more comfortable um, you know, analyzing that dump in your Windows uh, development machine. Um, but you, you have all that functionality at your fingertips by just using the Docker exec command. And you can essentially uh, create a shell into that Docker container and just pretend be in fun command line land and ex execute whatever command uh, you want to do. Exactly. Now, I just stopped the debugging experience uh, in Visual Studio. And if we will do Docker top again, you will see that all those processes has been terminated and now it's your container just running as is. Now, let's go back to this demo and really explain what this demo actually does uh, because we will try to solve several bugs here and show how you can actually use Visual Studio and other tools to debug containers. So the superheroes decided to start a night school and they have several courses that they are want to offer and they have their campus here with all kinds of rooms with different features. And the goal here is really how can we uh, schedule all those courses um, based on the number of teachers that we have and also based on the room features. So, for example, if we have this amount of students and we have two teachers to give the lectures, we can divide them into two rooms. If we have three TAs, then we can have three rooms to cover that. Now, let's go and start um, uh, debugging. Uh, we would like to understand some how that actually works. So. Uh, let's go to legalities for vigilantes. So we can assign a room here. That is great. We got uh, enough room for that one. And then let's assign a room uh, for the practice sessions. But you can see something interesting. Like uh, we now have two rooms in the assigned for lectures, but nothing for the lectures. So let's try again. So yeah, it seems that there is a bug here. Now, remember that before we only attached to one process. Now, luckily Visual Studio really gave us uh, another cool feature to help us debugging what we are doing. So we will actually shut down uh, our Docker and Compose. And you can see it's gracefully terminating all our Dockers. And we will go back to Visual Studio and when you do add here, you can also add container uh, orchestrator support, which basically create you this project and a Docker Compose that actually tell you, I want to run all those services at the same time. And we can set this as a startup project and click play. And it's boot everything, and soon it will open up a web page for the UI. As you can see, it's loading all the models. And we got that running. We even hit the breakpoint that we just said before. So we know everything is working. So let's continue. And one thing I'd, I'd like to point out here, Idan, is that um, what the way this project is orchestrated is sort of the classic microservice thinking, right? We have uh, service A, which is responsible for just scheduling courses. So it has to, to deal with things like who are the teachers and what, what is the material. Um, in, in, in strict microservice thinking, it would have its own database that's completely shut off from the rest of the world. And it will only have its own API that it exposes to the other services. And likewise, the service B the, that's responsible for rooms will only know about what are the rooms? What is the, how many people can we fit in a single room? What are the 
qualities or features? Is it soundproof? Does it have certain equipment that might be needed? Um, and we'll also simply expose an, an a, a API that was agreed upon in the beginning. And then um, what that means to the company, the organization is that the team that's working on service A um, can use whatever technology stack they want. If they're running inside of their Docker container, they could be running .NET, they could be running Python, they could be running Node.js. Um, as long as they uphold the API they, that they promised they will uphold, um, each team can work completely isolated from the other. And their code, their execution environment is completely isolated from the other as well. Exactly, exactly. Um, so we will actually try to show that by actually debugging two different events in two different microservices and try to follow the logic of why the rooms are not getting added to the right places. So let's go here again, and we want to add a, a room to the practical sessions. So we can go uh, and to the rooms controllers, and actually, no, I need to go to the course controller. And there is a function here that actually trying to assign a room uh, to the this course ID, this room ID, and to what purpose. So if we go here and assign a room here, we can see that it's uh, the purpose is lecture. So that seems uh, reasonable. Things look good here. Let's do here and assign here. And we can see that, oh, it's also lecture, but it should be practice. So now we can actually move um, our investigation from the microservices that actually do what uh, he asked to do here, just assign uh, two rooms to lecture, and actually go back to the details one. Uh, and the details page, actually, let's see here. Yeah, I think that is really the problem. And we just need to put uh, practice here and now everything is fine. So let's rerun it again. Right. And this is again now the classic microservices problem, right? Um, instead of having one big monolithic app, which I can put a breakpoint and start stepping through. Now, uh, our service UI, our single page application, is its own service. And that calls into a course service. And that calls into the room service to find what rooms are available to schedule to schedule the different lectures and practice sessions. And that tracking the bug across that very convoluted, very complicated chain of causality and of, of serv a service doing something and then making a rest call to another service that's doing something and then another rest call to another one that's doing something. Um, can become the bane of your existence pretty quickly if you don't know what are the, the tools that will enable you to deal with it um, pragmatically and productively. Exactly. Now, another interesting thing here is that I just changed the code, um, run it again, and very quickly we started the same application, which is interesting. Like we didn't do Docker build or Docker compose build, nothing really happened. And that is something that we really want to uh, mention here. Uh, and if we do Docker uh, PS again, you can see that it's different than we run Docker Compose. Uh, it starts from different images. Uh, the names of the services, or the name of the container are a little bit different. And even the command itself is different. So let's go back and investigate what is going on. And as you can see, the main command is just the tail minus F, which is just a trick in Docker to make this container live for a longer time. And as you can see inside, there is all kinds of commands that we saw before, how Visual Studio actually uh, create this remote debugging experience nice and for Docker. But those, uh, those Dockers here, or those containers are not based on the Docker file that you created. It's actually a lot of mimicking and, uh, and magic behind the scene with a lot of uh, mounts to that container that actually mount your NuGet packages and your source code and other things for VS Studio to really give you this fast iterative experience. But you need to know when you use the Docker Compose debugging features in Visual Studio, you're not really running your own images. You're running something that uh, Visual Studio created for you. 
And we'll put up a link in the show notes if you want to go deeper on that. It's just very important to realize that Visual Studio is doing some tricks behind the scenes to give you that super fast, productive uh, F5 time to breakpoint experience when you're working with Docker containers. It's not doing the full Docker Compose, which if you run it yourself, you'll see it takes quite a bit of time. Yeah. So let's clean up uh, uh, all the Dockers that Visual Studio left us. As you can see, they're still alive after we're done. And let's boot again uh, everything with Docker Compose. And I think that would be a good time to actually go and uh, think through about, um, actually, let's just summarize what we saw so far. <laughs> um, when you're debugging with Visual Studio, uh, your .NET app, you have two methods. One, like we said, attach to a process, go to the Docker, uh, attach to Docker file, to, to a Docker container, and then follow the step that we show you, or start up with a Docker Compose that would actually attach to all the running uh, processes that you have there, and it gives you some fast iterations and the allow to do multi-debugging between several microservices. But let's go back and think about what are the, the limits of debugging containers and what we see that people are actually struggling with. And that is really to think about containers usually are not living by themselves. Um, there is some cases that you only have one container, but usually you have several of them because we're trying to do microservices or we try to do better scaling of our application. Now, our container is running and VS Debug just pause our application to do some inspection. And from the outside, for all terms of purposes, it's a running container with an app inside that stopped responding. And that could be very tricky, specifically if that service actually at, at the end of uh, another microservice that tried to communicate with that. Now, because this server is paused, everything halts and that pipe actually will start break. And that process maybe itself would start to become unresponsive as well. So by you just posing one container to debug, you probably sometimes see the effect that would actually create this cascading error and start shutting down other microservices that you didn't intend to. I call it timeout hell. <laughs> um, Another interesting thing is uh, we use Docker Compose as something that would manage our uh, lifetime of all the containers. Uh, but there is um, other solutions like Kubernetes that would uh, ping and check if your container is uh, live and okay. But as soon as you hit a breakpoint there, this orchestrator would say, oh, this container is no longer functioning as we expect. Let's stop moving traffic to it. So if you expect it to debug, as soon as you hit breakpoints, sometimes it will, you don't get any traffic anymore or you need to attach to all of them in order to get all the traffic that you want to debug. Okay. And the, the orchestrator might just decide that you're, you're not responsive, so I'm just gonna kill you, et cetera, et cetera, right? And one more thing I would mention in this respect is that it also speaks to the um, eph ephemeral nature of containers or document containers running inside of an orchestrator and, and the challenges that that brings to debugging. And the same thing, of course, applies also to serverless functions, which are also ephemeral and temporary by their very nature, right? If I want to, um, um, you know, attach to a container to debug some piece of logic that's running in a big cluster, um, you know, which one do I attach to? And maybe the one that I actually thought I should attach to is gone by the time I actually attach to it. And another one is fun in its place, right? It's built on this very idea that we can scale out and containers are ephemeral. They come and go, right? Yeah. And if because they come and go and usually they're running in replica set to have good uh, service, um, it's very hard sometimes to know which container I need to attach to. Right, and so it's it's a very problematic thing when you moving away from just running one container per service on your local machine to actually debugging what happened in in production or in QA clusters. So let's just try to summarize everything that we covered here. 
Uh, freezing a container is bad <laughs> when you have a, a orchestrator that try to deal with it or you have a larger container, uh, larger cluster, uh, cascading errors, um, recycled uh, containers and things like that, and how you correlate events between multi-services. Uh, even more, um, when we actually try to debug interesting cases that only happen in production, freezing a process most of the time is out of scope. Like there is no uh, feasibility to do that. But even if you actually get the permission to do it, um, by just freezing a process, you can actually start triggering alerts of production that will then trigger auto scaling and other things or wake up other operating people and then they will kill your container because it's not working anymore. So there is a problem with that. And another thing, because this is actually production data, it's people, personal data, you need also to consider how do you protect the privacy and the security of your users and your clients. Now, yeah, just one more thing I would add there is that that notion of correlating events across the different microservices, um, that is a killer uh, um, struggle right there, right? Because, you know, you know that, you know, you got get that angry phone call um, or that pager duty um, SMS at the middle of the night. Um, and then you know that there's a problem that's tied to a specific user, but it's only happening to, let's say, 0.5% of your user base. How do I even track, you know, the, you know, user made a request from their web app or their single page application to service A, cross service B to service C? How do I even debug that? How do I even track that correlation? Um, that can be extremely tricky in and of itself. Usually what we end up doing is just adding a bunch of logging, redeploying the code, waiting for the next time it happens and going through that whole flow. Exactly. And it's interesting why the logs uh, actually introduced back and became just a really good tool when it comes to debugging containers. And because when we do local debugging, it's what we call intrusive debugging. There is two things that you're trying to do. First, you try to extract the information from the system, like logs. But when you do actual debugging, you can see local variables. You can inspect memory. You can add breakpoints, things like that. And these things actually happen pretty fast, milliseconds. It's happening computer speed. But then you actually get the data. And now you start to reason about it. And that is human speed. And that is hard. Uh, that is a lot of hard logic problems. So I would say even slow human speed, because it's a very hard process to do. But non-intrusive debugging really tried to break it apart. What if we allow computer do what computer do best and extract all the information that we need from the system and then reason about it out of the fact? And really, this is what we're trying to do. Try to understand the system behavior without the need to freeze it. And like Omer said, it's been around uh, non-intrusive debugging for years now. Uh, as a student for software, everybody know how to do console write line, right? But then there is uh, the next evolution um, when which that is logging. Um, and actually there is uh, a term called structural logging. Uh, Omer, would you like to elaborate a little bit about that? Sure, so today, typically we're no longer just you know, logging a plain text message. Um, we know the template of the message so we can embed the values, for example, in this scenario, the customer's uh, identity and their age. And by separating the message from the actual values, um, we can do advanced filtering, like give me all the logs for the customer's aged above 70 or whatever, to try and extract more meaning from um, the logs. And that has become a necessity because, because of the fact that as an industry, we've sort of regressed from being able to actually debug our applications. Now, because they're all running as these isolated pieces of software talking to each other somewhere in the cloud, we um, need that, those crazy amounts of logs to be able to extract any meaning from, from the system, right? Exactly. And I think that is the next evolution. I, I, I think most companies today are generation one today and using some so, uh, services like Datadog or Logs.io or uh, Elk uh, Stacks to actually collect all the logs from all the system into one place and then start filtering. But then there was another issue that what if the code that you are using it's not your own code, it's an open source project. How you correlate your own logs to their logs to understand long and complex transactions that jump between microservices. 
And that's what the open tracing uh, solution is trying to do. Um, and, and like you mentioned, the problem here is you, if you try to debug things from Logan and you don't see what you actually need, then you start this um, um, cat and mouse race, you know, add more logs uh, to figure out what's missing and then deploy again, see what happened, deploy again, see what happened. And that is really consuming. And it's actually the solution becomes a problem because in order to debug things, you just add more logs. And if you have more logs, now you need better tools to actually understand what is going on. Exactly. And that, yeah. Uh, the, the paradox I would say there is that, you know, if I knew in advance what bits of log I would need in order to uh, solve the problem, I probably wouldn't have just made the bug in the first place, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and I think that is what we are trying to represent here today. And that is what we call uh, the next generation of code level observability. What if we can actually capture everything that you will need in order to um, resolve the bugs that you found? So let's go and let's have a look of how that actually happens. So when we actually um, run the last time, we actually installed our Docker agent, um, sorry, our, our uh, Osgood agent for Docker inside the Docker file. So every a, every Docker now attach, uh, attached to our agent. And if we will go to our debugger, you can see that we have those three agents are running and start capturing what is going on. So, so Don, let me just pause you there because you said a lot of things and my head is about to explode. So I, let, let's unpack for a second, right? Um, sure. The Osgood Production Debugger, what that is, for those of you who might not be familiar, is a web-based uh, debugging platform uh, that allows us to um, debug things that are happening in our production staging and QA environments with the same ease as we could through Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, JetBrains Writer. And what Idan just showed us is that all we needed to do in order to get our code that's running inside of our Docker container to be monitored and uh, up for debugging in the Osgood production debugger is to simply add a few lines to our Docker file, right? We didn't actually need to change any of our code. We didn't need to consume a NuGet package. We just added a few lines of code to the Docker file to get that agent in there, the Osgood agent, and uh, we are up and running. Exactly. So, um... Really, in the save of time, we will try to generate a new error. And we have this automatic scheduling that actually try to find rooms and figure out all kinds of things, cool things. And we actually managed to schedule two, close, two courses automatically with just a click of a button. And we tried this one, but nothing happened. If we will go back, we can actually see there was two exceptions actually happened here. And there is the stack here. But if we will go back to our production debugger, refresh the page, you can see that it's also captured here. And it says that it's in capturing mode. So while I'm creating uh, creating the second exception, Omar, can you go and explain what that actually means? Sure. So when an exception happens, the Oscode agent monitors and sees that an exception happened. It sees the call stack. It analyzes the uh, code path of execution that led to that particular exception. And it turns on lightweight code instrumentation along that path. So the second time that the exception occurs, as we're seeing here, it becomes captured. So Oscode has captured um, the, the um, actual debugging experience that we see here, which again, looks just like Visual Studio. We have our call stack, we have our locals window, we can see all of the different locals, and we actually can see the code, the decompiled code um, that was running in production at the moment that the exception happened. And we can hover over all the different variables and see drill into all their members, just like we could in the Visual Studio debugger. The thing that's really interesting though, is that when we hit that button to that Idan is clicking on right now, that camera icon, we're actually requesting a full full time travel recording of this exception. So let's say we find an exception that's really interesting. We want to get some more details. By requesting the full time travel recording, Oscode will generate um, you know, basically the same level of information the next time that the exception happens as we would have gotten if we had somehow managedly, uh, magically managed to reproduce the same exact bug on our local Visual Studio laptop and just start stepping through the code. As you can see here, 
Osgood gives us really through this, uh, um, what we call the heads up display for the debugger, the visual interface, it actually shows us line by line what happened. So we can see here, for example, that every expression that was uh, false is painted in red. Every expression that was uh, true is painted in green. Uh, we can see that in the second if statement, we had a short circuit evaluation. So the second Boolean expression wasn't evaluated. So it's in strike through. And every expression here, every parameter, every uh, method call has this annotation above it, which shows us what the return value was, right? And every piece of code that was not executed is grayed out. So we can really see the code execution and we can read the code execution and it's even uh, nicer than having to step through the code to see what happened. Yeah, so basically what, if I understand what you said, um, it's actually similar to put a breakpoint on every line, right? right? And then inspect what actually changed. But what I really love about it that it's actually show you, you just need to read it, right? That with, like you said, with those highlights, you can actually understand the exact flow of what happened. And as you can see here, our problem is that available room was null. So this function that we actually ask service B to get the available rooms return null. So let's see what uh, service B is actually telling us. So let's go and debug this one. And you can see here that feature was null and we thought that this default value would actually kick in, but it seems that the way that code was called and you can actually go expand all the other things above here, it's actually running all the parameters here. So it's actually past null and that's what really caused the problem. So we can see here, um, just by installing the agent, we get the same fidelity of getting exceptions from all the containers into one place and easily try to correlate between what happened before and after. Now, for the last demo that we wanna show is another example here that we are trying to schedule. So it seems that it's booked two rooms, but there is no students here. So, and if we will go, um, if we go here, there is no exception. So how do you debug those cases? And we would like to introduce a feature that will come soon, um, very soon uh, to production debugger and that is called trace points. So that really allow you to debug those tricky logical issues that is very hard to catch that doesn't really create an exception that we can automatically capture. So let's start that. Schedule bug. So now we are creating our own private debugging session and we will start to adding the breakpoints that we would like. Now, unlike logging that you need to think about what information you want to extract, the way we think about trace point is what interesting point in time you would like to inspect. So let's start with the room controllers because maybe the problem is actually in the room controller that doesn't book the right rooms. So and wait, hold on, Idan. What did you just do? Uh, I want to pause there because you did that really quickly and you did something that's kind of amazing right now. So um, what Idan just did is that he essentially did the equivalent of a control T in ReSharper or JetBrains Writer where we navigate or Visual Studio where we navigate across all of the different code that we have. Only what we're uh, navigating through is all of the code that we have running in production right now across all of our Docker containers. And when Idan picked the rooms controller, it ex immediately extracted the decompiled code that it's running in production right now. And now we're actually able to debug it with non-breaking breakpoints. Again, non-intrusive debugging. Exactly, this is crazy because you don't need to worry about source control integrations and remember which version you're using. This is actually what is running right now in, in, the, in the cluster. So here we had uh, a, a trace point that when we actually get all the available room, I want to get the notifications. Basically, we're creating a structured logging with uh, tell me um, which rooms did I get and with which features. So we created this one. There is another thing that I would like to do and really understand if there was a problem booking the room. So let's create this one. And yeah, I think we're good in this microservices. 
let's start adding um, more trace points to the other one. So here, let's go to the function that actually resolves the schedule. And in this line here, we actually ask the room service to schedule the new schedule and assign all the needed rooms. So let's put a breakpoint here because I want to investigate more what happened here. And we can put a break, another breakpoint here. And you can see that here we find the lectures room and the practice room. So let's dive here. There is some loop here. And here we actually find the room. So let's report and, that we find a room here. And Idan, okay, just ahead. if you could open that trace point again, let's just explain briefly that what we're doing right now is we're adding logging to the code that's already running in production. And through that syntax that Idan was using where inside curly braces, he's putting the actual values we want logged, um, we can add that logging after the fact. But really, as Idan mentioned, it doesn't really matter what we picked because Osgood is capturing all of the local variables as you'll see in a moment, and we can uh, um, see everything that was happening at that particular point in time. Okay. Then now we finish with setting up our debugging session and now we can start debugging. And as you can see here, it's a, um, we, in Osgood, we're really careful of not overload your servers. So when you start capturing events, it's already start with a given time frame and also limit the amount of events that you will capture. And when we finish, we will just remove all the instrumentation that we just added. And let's go and ask it to schedule again. Let's go back here and you can see those events start streaming into the system. So let's start with the course controller. Um, we can see here, let's go to the first point that we put in course controller that try to put up the new schedule. And we can see here that the new schedule is, oh, there is no lecture rooms. There is just two practice room. So we can already filter out that the room controller didn't do what they needed to do. We already put some uh, breakpoints here that they are going to about to be booked. And you can see here how many rooms was found for each, uh, for each request. But it seems that the schedule that this automatic algorithm found was broken somehow. So we can see that practice actually worked. So if we look here, uh, this is where we actually uh, schedule the second room for the practical sessions. Uh, and you can see room number two, you can see it, the max capacity is 50. So that is a big room. And the previous room was 10 people. So. We booked, 60, <laughs> we booked a room with 60 people for the practice, but we didn't find any room for the lecture. But you can see here that we are trying to find the optimal room from the available lecture rooms. And where are those? Here they are. So there is 12 possible rooms, but we haven't chosen anyone. The reason for that is this field desire room capacity, which is 20, because we only have one teacher for 20 students. But the largest room that we have is only 10 people. So we decided, oh, I couldn't do anything and just stopped. And that is really, and now we know the bug and the issue. Now, the magic things that happen here, I didn't really need to worry about what I need to capture. All the code level observability has already been captured for you. You can then sit and relax, have a drink and resolve the bugs. We know that you didn't have to freeze your uh, production. And also you didn't need to deploy a new version to add more logs and remove logs. Uh, Absolutely. And one more thing I would add to that is that even if you don't manage to solve that bug yourself, because the Osgood production debugger is essentially running out of your web browser, um, you can just collaborate with your colleagues, right? You can use the deep links feature where you can send a link to a particular uh, um, value, to a particular uh, trace point hit um, to your colleague, and they will open that link, go directly to that particular variable or that particular moment in time, um, and see exactly what you're seeing. So it's sort of like collaborating on a GitHub pool request, only here you're collaborating on um, actually debugging something. Awesome. 
so and uh, with that, I think um, we are done with the content that we want to show you today. I hope it was helpful. Um, we have four more minutes. <laughs> Uh, Omer, would you like to take several QAs? Uh, sure. Let's see what ask? we can do. Um, uh, so Thomas asked, what happens if you screw up trace points or logging, like house.room.foobar where room is null? That would lead to a null reference exception in the trace point or logging. Is this possible? Or what happens to your application? Um, that's a great question, Thomas. So as we mentioned, um, trace points are completely um, non-intrusive. It's not actually changing your code behind the scene. No state of any of your variables will chain and no exceptions can actually occur. If you do uh, writing in a chain that um, has a null in it, it will just tell you that thing was null. So we can get, if, if address dot uh, um, city is, uh, is not available because address was null, you'll simply get an error message telling you that address was null and nothing bad will happen at all. Um, Harold asks, does this production debugger only works for .NET Core services? The answer is no. It works for um, all of .NET. So even you know your legacy apps running on IAS on Windows Server 2008 on your uh, um, um, .NET Framework 4.6.1 applications, it will work just as well as on your Linux Docker containers. Uh, same for any cloud services, Azure app service, um, Azure functions, all of that is fully supported. Um, so Idan, um, there's an interesting question here. Um, does this uh, uh, work only with Linux container or the, are Windows containers also supported? So um, yeah, we also, yeah, that is a great question. So like uh, Omer mentioned, our agent is know how to run inside the virtual machines uh, based on Windows and also on a Linux. And because we know how to run on Windows, we also able to run the agent for Windows inside Windows container. Uh, the way you embed it is a little bit different because it's a Windows operating system. So please reach out and we can show you exactly what's the step you need to take in order to run it inside the Windows container which is a great solution to debug legacy code. Awesome. So there are quite a few questions here. I'm gonna sort of combine them. Um, there's a question about what we showed in the beginning. Uh, can we debug for an IDE? Is that possible with JetBrains Rider or Visual Studio Code? Um, the answer is yes on both. Both JetBrains Rider and Visual Studio Code have similar functionality to what we showed today in Visual Studio. And the VS Code thing uses the same exact thing under the hood as what we showed you today, yeah. the VSDBG uh, thing. That's how it's working behind the scenes. Um, the next question from Simon is, what kind of memory and CPU overhead do I have to expect when I integrate Osgood Production Debugger in my Docker Compose? In your Docker Compose? Yep. Um, OK. Um, so in terms of image size, I think uh, it's around 40 megabyte uh, addition to your image. Uh, basically, what it does, the installation process, is uh, extracting the agent binaries and add them into the OSCODE folder inside your container and also set up the .NET Core to load it as soon as your application is get loaded. Um, Omer, do you like to take the uh, impact on memory and CPU usage? Right, so um, the way the OSCODE production debugger works is it's constantly um, employing self-throttling. It's essentially, um, you know, um, monitoring its own performance impact and um, scaling down the level of instrumentation in a way that ensures that we never cross 3% uh, CPU overhead. But because the entire product was built with performance as the top priority feature, it's very rare that our own um, self-throttler actually gets uh, employed in that sense. Um, in terms of memory usage, because Oscar Production Debugger does not use lightweight memory, memory dumps or memory dumps or any of that technology, um, the actual memory impact is very much negligible. Um, so we have a few more questions. Um, uh, we're all over time, but we'll um, stay here and answer as much of your questions as, as we can in a few short minutes. Um, so there's another question uh, here from Roy. Um, 
is the application that we are currently debugging with trace points built on release? Let's say it's built with optimized uh, compiler uh, flag turned on. Can we still debug? The answer to that is absolutely. Um, that's actually one of the big advantages of the Oscar production debugger is that it works just fine for code that is optimized. And even the methods where you put your trace points continue to run, all of your code continue to run in release mode, fully optimized with the best performance. Um, so um, the next question uh, here, uh, let's see um, what uh, I, Thomas asks, I assume your Oscode debugger is res registered as a profiler. Um, so it would not be possible to use another profiler. So that's a great question. Indeed, we are running as a CLR profiler and there is a limitation in .NET that you cannot have more than one profiler installed at a time. However, we do enable a multiplexer solution uh, and we test that against uh, a certain profiler. So things like uh, if you're using New Relic or Datadog or um, Dynatrace, trace all of those things are supported we have done the hard work of ensuring and testing that our multiplexer knows how to um, allow those solutions um, and the output production debugger um, to work simultaneously without any problem um, same with application insights and many other tools so um, if there's a particular tool that um, you would like the output production debugger to work with just let us know and we'll see if we can uh, work that out for you um, okay so uh, let's see, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. I think we're just about covered all our bases here. Um, I think that with that, we can say thank you very much, everyone, for being here. It's been a pleasure presenting this uh, demo for you. Please stay tuned to our website. Our next session will go deeper into how do we debug distributed applications, uh, expanding more on this concept of non-breaking breakpoints. So uh, Idan, thank you very much as well for being our lovely presenter today. And we'll see you all at the next webinar. Thank you, everybody. And have a great day. <laughs>